Hello, everyone. Has everyone um, been here for a couple of days? You all heard about this um, 5G transformation of how it changes our economies, our industries, our cities, and our lives. We heard about the evolution of the intelligent, uh, connected intelligent edge and about our, the great business opportunities that come about with 5G. A recent study that was released last week indicated that more than 22 cities have now 5G coverage. And it's more than a third of it that they obtained it in the last year during the pandemic. And by the end of this year, the number of countries that are gonna have 5G networks are coming somewhere to around 72. But behind this 5G transformation is the indispensable yet limited resource, that of spectrum. And we will discuss in the next few minutes how this limited resource is used to deliver on the 5G promise. First, we're gonna talk about the different types of spectrum that are critical in the successful deployment of 5G. And second, we're gonna talk about the regulatory solutions and the innovative technologies that have allowed for the efficient use of this limited resource. Qualcomm led, the, led us from 3G to 4G to 5G wireless technology and all the capabilities that comes with each generation of that technology have increased, but so have the consumer demands on uh, the consumer data broadband demands. And today the 5G networks can achieve speeds more than 20 times those of 4G networks of just a few years ago. Just for smartphones globally, the average consumer usage, it has now exceeds 11 gigabits. We expect that number to get up to 41 gigabits by the end of 2027. And to support all of this ever-growing demand, we need more spectrum. But at the same time, we need to utilize what has already been allocated to carriers and have to find more efficient and innovative ways of sharing the spectrum. But let's take a step back. Up until the 5G revolution, cellular technologies generally use spectrum below four gigahertz because of the attributes of that spectrum, the propagation characteristics, and the fact that the state of the art was up to that point then. Now, with 5G, a wide array of different spectrum bands are available for use. In fact, 5G was designed to use different types of spectrum. And deployments um, for 5G have to be across these bands to fully have a successful deployment. That will allow the operators to optimize their networks and depending on the network needs that they have and on the user demands, and, that, and serve the specific needs of their customers. So the higher performance and improved efficiency of 5G technology, especially when using the appropriate spectrum, supports important use cases. And you all heard a number of different use cases over the last two days. I think one of the most important ones is the, um, of the, the promise of 5G to close the digital divide in many areas where either people don't have the latest technology or don't even have connectivity. And bringing the, uh, bridging the digital divide is one of the top priorities for regulators around the world. And of course, another example is the uh, industrial IoT, because you have so many capabilities with 5G technology that allow for high reliability and for coverage and low latency and high capacity. Now, in order to understand how all these use cases operate, we're gonna look at these different types of spectrum. First, we're gonna talk about low band spectrum. And that is frequencies below one gigahertz. And this spectrum offers great, excellent coverage 
and for both indoors and outdoors because the signals can travel further and can penetrate buildings and other obstructions. However, the low band spectrum cannot carry as much data as mid band spectrum or high band spectrum. In the mid band spectrum, we talk usually about frequencies between one gigahertz and seven gigahertz. It's that, that place in the spectrum between those two frequencies. They provide very good coverage and they have even better, high, higher capacity than the low bands. So 5G deployments of these bands balance both speed and coverage and support service in wider areas besides urban centers and uh, with a quite high reliability of, um, a, a reliable quality of service. To date, mid-band spectrum has been where most um, operators have deployed 5G worldwide. At the same time, more mid-band spectrum is needed. In the US, we're currently looking to get more spectrum between 3.1 to 3.45. Congress has set, requested the, that the government looks for about 200 megahertz within that band. Similar efforts are underway to open up as much spectrum in the 3.3 to 4.2 band worldwide to achieve a much more harmonized global spectrum. <clears throat> now, high band spectrum is what we call the millimeter wave, right? And includes frequencies from 24 gigahertz and above. And in the, U the US was the first country that opened this band for mobile use back in 2016. Up until that time, those bands were used for satellite service and for fixed microwave service. And no one thought the mobile use was something that could happen in those bands. But when, when, they opened it, um, when the FCC opened those bands in 2060, they specifically opened 28, 37, and 39 gigahertz bands, there were no available equipment. There were no available devices, no chipsets. But Qualcomm made that happen with engineering innovations and tireless R&D efforts. It all started by wheeling equipment in our parking lot in our Bridgewater facility in New Jersey and up um, in, here in uh, location in San Diego. And eventually they, they shrunk all that mobile support to put it into your mobile handsets, both for millimeter wave and for sub seven gigahertz bands. Now the millimeter waves have this large amount of bandwidth and enable um, operators <clears throat> to deliver the fastest uh, multi-gigabit cellular speeds and low latency connectivity. With, um, which is, all of this is critical in unleashing the, pro uh, the promise of 5G and addressing the massive increase in mobile and fixed wireless data. So just for illustration purposes, testing has showed us that when the network is congested, millimeter wave 5G delivered download speeds that were almost four times as high as those delivered by mid-band or low-band speeds. And even to put it more in context, even if the network is conge congested in the millimeter wave, it can achieve almost the same speeds as the ones that you can achieve in the mid-band when it is congested. Now the beauty of the millimeter wave is that there's more of it, the millimeter wave bands, is that there's more spectrum there than we can find in low band or mid-band spectrum. And you have a 100 milli, um, megahertz channelization there, that's the norm for these frequencies and allows the um, 5G wireless technology to deploy and showcase all these use case scenarios that we said. And again, we'll talk about where can we use millimeter wave? And, and they've mentioned earlier today and yesterday, starting with places that are usually very crowded because you have the ability to provide, to serve a lot of users with ultra fast connections in very crowded places. So think about Stadium, and you can do it indoors and outdoors. Think about stadiums, conference centers, big office buildings, 
factory floors. Then you have the scenario of massive IoT, where you can have um, industrial automation and precision p positioning, smart farming, where you can do tracking and monitoring, and a number of other functionalities. And of course, most of what people think of is the immersive and mobile experiences that one can have, um, like AR, VR, and XR experiences using the millimeter wave. And even though most of the people think of that in this context of gaming or other entertainment um, settings, th those technologies can be used and have started to be used in other, um, set, in other um, um, uh, you know, within the, another context, is like educational settings or training settings in medical centers where you can ho have diagnostics or remote surgery. <coughs> now, the other one, there was a session earlier about fixed wireless access, and that's one of the biggest promises of the millimeter wave because it, um, it is a viable alternative to fiber it can actually connect the unconnected and bridge the digital divide that we mentioned earlier. And especially during the pandemic, when pretty much almost everyone around the world had to learn to work remotely or be educated remotely with all the kids at home. And as the testing has showed us, there, this is a cost-effective solution where you can actually have broadband services of, a, of the gigabit range that can reach up to 10 kilometers. Now, there's several companies that start offering this business case, including Verizon, that I believe has started doing it in the business setting for about 54 cities. Now, as we noted earlier, um, there are, are a lot of operators and carriers that embrace the millimeter connectivity. In Japan, all commercial wireless carriers have adopted uh, deployed commercial millimeter wave. In the US, the carriers are starting to build out their networks. They have regulatory requirements that are coming due in the next few years, so they're gonna be building that. And just think about that the global GDP impact of 5G use by 2034 has been estimated to reach over 950, no, sorry, $550 billion. Now, since spectrum resources are limited, as we said, it is important to continue making um, a innovative in intensive use of the spectrum that's currently allocated. And this has been the core of uh, Qualcomm's R&D. One of the reasons why 5G is successful is because of the technological solution of dynamic spectrum sharing. And the technology, that technology enables sharing of a spectrum channel dynamically allocating between the 5G network and the 4G network depending on usage. That means that they, the existing infrastructure can support the 5G and can optimally be used and utilized, which saves both time and money. And a number of carriers have been using this technology so they don't have to refarm their 4G spectrum. But besides the technological innovations, there are other different regulatory solutions that allow for um, spectrum use. Most of us are, tend to know the, the most common one is exclusive use. So you clear the band, and then you license, you most of the times auction it, and you license it to one user who has exclusive use. This is what most of the um, carriers use around the world. So an example of it is in the United States, in the 3.4 to 4.2 gigahertz band, there used to be satellite use. What the FCC determined is they're gonna relocate the users from the lower part of the band to the upper part of the band and auction 280 megahertz of that prime mid-band spectrum to wireless carriers for 5G deployments. Now, besides exclusive use, which allows one carrier to use its, that particular spectrum, 
there should be other ways that we can use the spectrum. And that's where we talk about sharing. And how can we all use, how can we all share the spectrum? So a lot of countries consider the regulatory and, and regulatory and licensing paradigms to determine this um, question and make diverse users and diverse uses operate on the same band. In Europe, for example, they do a lot of sharing of the bands by focusing on geographical separation. Um, the UK has um, issued a licensing regime about localized access for private networks in a number of bands. The mid band at 3.8 to 4.2, the millimeter wave, and low bands. And that encourages the establishment of private networks where they can have better control and reliability and resilience and security over their own networks. And those you can see um, used in like smart agriculture and mining and industrial IoT and a different type of uh, enterprise users can make use of these licenses. Now the latest consultation out of the UK is about the 26 uh, gigahertz band. And there they're gonna do a mix of sharing uh, one different model for high density areas and another one for low, for more rural areas in an effort to make the most efficient use of spectrum. Now the EU is also looking to do some more harmonized um, use of that, the same kind of band in the mid band um, using a similar model. And also the FCC, when it was licensing for the millimeter wave, try to also accommodate satellite and the wireless carriers. Now, in the US, we have some other models of sharing. And one that comes to mind, a, a, a little bit more complicated scenario, is um, the 3.5 gigahertz band, or CBRS, service. In this, the, the, there are three types of users that have access to the same band. The incumbents, the, the majority of them are the military radars. They're on the ships. It's what you will find in the aircraft carriers that travel up and down the coast of the US. And then the, the next set of users, the military um, radars, need to be protected at all times. But there was a lot of spectrum left in the middle of the country that no one was using. Um, so what they did is they auctioned the band for priority access licensees. And they did that, and then they allowed for opportunistic use with a generalized, uh, general authorized um, access users. So what in effect you have is, is three flavors. You've got the people that always need to be protected. Then you've got the PALs, which have priority use of the band. And then you have the GAA, which is a little bit like unlicensed use. How this ban works is with the use of spectrum managers, commonly referred as SaaS. They're different companies that basically monitor and uh, tell you how to use and how to share the spectrum. You have to have devices that communicate with the managers, make a request of using a particular frequency at a particular location, and then the SaaS will give you the okay to do so or not. Now, Qualcomm has been inventing new 5G spectrum sharing technologies at, in order to unlock more use of spectrum and make more efficient use of spectrum uh, and broaden the 5G ec ecosystem. So now, one of the proposals that um, Qualcomm has out relates to the lower 37 gigahertz band. So we're in the millimeter band right now. It's about 600 megahertz. And this band was opened up for use, for license use, in July 2016 by the FCC. But they have not determined yet under what regime they're going to do this, meaning what are the service rules? How can one operate in this 600 megahertz? And there are a number of considerations to do that. So one of Qualcomm's proposals, well, Qualcomm's proposal is um, a very simple technology neutral solution that would allow multiple licensees to use all 600 megahertz at the same place, at the same time, using the same frequency, and taking advantage the inherently highly directional microwave communications, the beams. And now we're going to talk about the 
other category of license use that everyone seems to be more familiar with, which is unlicensed use. You'll have unlicensed networks in your homes and nothing else. And this environment is where you can have different uses and different technologies all coexist. You don't need a license to do this. There's no priority in use. There's no interference protection. But there's certain rules of operation. Most of the time, it's OK to operate on uh, unlicensed spectrum. They have an acceptable level of service, but it is not guaranteed. And the quality of the connection sometimes can suffer. And I'm sure you all have um, dealt with that. Within the context of 5G, our uh, NRU um, uses unlicensed spectrum. And at this time, it's mostly on to sub-7 gigahertz frequencies. And they can, uh, it can be used with an anchor channel in licensed spectrum, or it can be used as a standalone service. It has a lot of benefits. It's very similar to LTE LAA. And, um, and now we've seen that Qualcomm not only de develops technology that uses all these this d different bands and different frequency bands, but also uses different types of models of using uh, spectrum, both as an exclusive use, as shared, and as unlicensed. And uh, we're driven every day by the challenge of doing more and less spectrum, and we want to do it in a much more in an energy efficient way. So, 5G networks incorporate energy efficient technologies, saving up to 90% energy per bit when compared to 4G networks. And our innovations um, have allowed for the development of um, equipment and networks that are more energy efficient, but also leveraging those communication technologies for, for the companies that use them to an extent to enable sustainability and uh, lower their emissions. That is especially important for the mobile industry. And that is because their energy consumption and emissions are projected to increase because of the rapidly growing population, because of the rapidly growing demand for connectivity and high-speed data and computational resources, and the rapidly growing demand on mobile infrastructure to support the Internet of Things. But Qualcomm's work does not end here with 5G being deployed around the world. Qualcomm has successfully commercialized 5G release 15 and 16. They just worked diligently to evolve into release 17 that our speaker will explain to us in, right after me, and continues to work towards release in 18 and the evolution into 5G advanced. And with our long-term wireless research, we're paving the way to 6G, which is expected to become the next platform of innovations starting in about a decade, or the end of this decade, I should say. We're looking to identify spectrum from 6G. And if you remember back when we discussed the different bands, there was a band in the middle we didn't discuss, which is between 7 and 24. And we have identified uh, our point of interest between 7 and 15, which is something that even the Federal Communications Commission has acknowledged as the area of interest for 6G. So as we are progressing and with our R&D, we look forward for innovation solutions that will allow this precious resource of spectrum to be effectively used for now the 6G, for now, for the future, for the 6G. Thank you very much.